Good afternoon, and welcome to the final webinar in our series on MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. I'm Pamela Blue. Today's webinar is presented by Jonathan Gruden, Principal Researcher in the Adaptive Systems and Interaction Group at Microsoft Research and an Affiliate Professor at the University of Washington Information School. Jonathan speaks and writes frequently about his work in the area of human-computer interactions. Have a look at his interesting article in the November-December issue of Interactions entitled Two Women Who Pioneered User-Centered Design about Lillian Gilbreth, the first industrial organizational psychologist and the model for the mother in the book and later the film Cheaper by the Dozen, and Grace Hopper, the revolutionary computer scientist reputedly responsible for coining the word bug to describe computer glitches. Early next year, Jonathan will be honored for his contributions in the field of human-computer interactions when he will be presented with the first Lasting Impact Award at the Computer Supported Cooperative Work Conference to be held here in Baltimore. Jonathan is presently collaborating on an in-depth survey on MOOCs and his presentation will include some thoughts on the future of the MOOC movement. Will it be recognized as a viable instructional method or become a passing phenomenon? Today's presentation will be recorded and you will receive a link to the recording shortly after the conclusion of the program. We invite you to submit questions via the question box on your screen. Jonathan will respond to questions at the end of his presentation. If there are more questions than time allows, Jonathan has kindly agreed to respond to any remaining questions in writing and the answers will be emailed to you. And now there may be a short delay as I turn the podium over to Jonathan. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, as the case may be. Thank you, Pamela, for the introduction. I assume that you are hearing me now. Um, Jonathan, we're hearing you, but we're not, not seeing your screen. Well, I did accept the... Oh, there we go. Sorry. Yes. All done. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. So, I studied technology adoption, and in... Uh, and currently, I've been looking at education, both K-12 and higher education, uh, which is will be the main focus of my remarks uh, today. I will get around to talking about MOOCs and their um, possible future. But first, I want to set some framework, uh, a framework to help you think about the uh, changes as they come along. So what I want to first of all do is be, uh, clearly predicting the future is a risky business. And I want to say why uh, technology, the impact of technology is particularly difficult to anticipate. And it's because we face a, an immovable object and an irresistible force uh, and when we're studying human-computer interaction. The immovable object is human nature, which uh, for better or worse, does not change uh, over time very much. Uh, we, there, what we do changes, but we have a perceptual, cognitive, emotional, and social behaviors which are really have been wired into us over the last, uh, over the centuries, and um, and it's the and and create a, a constraint with, uh, with, with and what's possible for us to do with technology. Now the irresistible force here is, in fact, technology, uh, in particular digital technologies which are just changing with unprecedented speed. And so you can imagine almost anything as being possible when you look at digital technologies, but the constraints are imposed by human nature on what we can actually do with the technology. And very often the things that do not work out do not work out because they violate um, uh, certain behaviors that we're uh, that we are prone to uh, exhibit, either cognitively or socially. And I, what I want to do is talk a little bit about how to think about technology growth, one side of this, of this uh, divide. And it's possible that the next few minutes will be the most useful um, part of this, of this talk for, in helping you think about 
the changes that are coming along and what might be coming along in the near uh, in the near future. There have been studies done, psychologists did studies that showed that we, the people reason very poorly about exponential growth, uh, about superlinear growth. And even when they're presented with data, um, they reason, uh, they, presenting people with data does not necessarily help them reason better about exponential growth. Even graphical data often leads to worse performance. Um, and as a result, when things are changing exponentially, and it has effects on us, uh, we misattribute them. We don't realize what the basis of those changes are. And I've been thinking about why it is that we don't reason better about exponential growth and why looking at data doesn't help us. And one conclusion is that we don't encounter exponential growth very often in our lives, but we do in encounter linear change more frequently. And, and here are two of the charts that are most frequently used to uh, depict exponential growth. On the left is a, is a normal um, linear uh, plot, and you do see the, the growth starting there, but it looks almost linear. We only look at the first few iterations. It would then soon be rising out of the view of the chart. So that looks almost linear. On the right is a log linear plot where we can see the, the growth over a longer period of time, but of course it does look exactly linear. And I think that these graphical illustrations are um, part of the reason we don't recognize the differences of exponential and linear growth. So when we look at Moore's Law um, in, in technology, which is the doubling of, of capabilities every year or year and a half, uh, here I've shown the first you know, 10 years of Moore's Law, you see this, this doubling. And again, it is almost a linear um, chart there. But now I'm going to show, I'm going to quickly go through another way of depicting this change that I think provides greater insight into what is actually going on. So here we have, have Moore's Law the first 10 years again. And what I'm going to do now is step through the next 40 years, but in order to fit it onto this, this graph, I'm going to have to change the scale of the y-axis. So here it is after 20 years. Here it is after 30. Here it is after 40 and 50. And so what you see is you see that it has the same form, but the scale, of course, is, is because the numbers are rising rapidly exponentially, the scale is changing, but the same, uh, the curve shows the same form, and in particular, you see a very rapid rise. When you get to the area of current interest, the rise is extremely, um, is extremely sharp. So now I'm going to go through this again. Uh, it's 10 years, 20 years. And here in the early 1980s is where I was when I was working as a software developer. And there was this bomb overhead that, I, that we didn't see coming. Looking back, it doesn't look like change is, is occurring at a very rapid rate. But there was this bomb overhead. I was working on software design. And that bomb was the graphical user interface. And although it did not seem to be coming very quickly, it did come. Uh, in 1985. And here's another view of what happened in 1985. I have, I've shown here two, this is a log linear plot. And what it does is it shows the cost of computers that could actually support a graphical user interface over time. And the first one, the TX2 at MIT, was this incredibly expensive uh, machine in which Ivan Sutherland built the first icons, the first graphical user interface. And every 10 years or so, the price of machines that would support a graphical user interface dropped dramatically. That's the black line. The blue line shows what people in HCI and the human computer interaction field were studying, which were machines that were widely available uh, to consumers and to businesses. And what you see is that those two charts crossed in 1985 when the Macintosh, when the second version of the Macintosh came along that could really support a graphical user interface and 
uh, and run applications of some significance. And so at that point, the whole field of human-computer interface interaction changed. We went away from command lines and forms to, to icons and windows and, and menus that popped up or pulled down. And so the whole field changed dramatically uh, at that point. So again, there's where I was. This came along and completely changed the field of human-computer interaction and user interface design. And then every since then, there have been bombs going off in different areas uh, on a regular basis. So 10 years later, you had the whole photographic film industry was radically changed. Digital photography took hold much faster than the, the photographic than the photography companies realized. Many of them went, went bankrupt. The audio swapping came along, and the music industry was affected. And so more recently, we've got, here we are, we're looking back. At the current scale that we're operating with, we don't see any real change, just a slow rise coming along. But there are these major changes ahead of us, as there have been uh, from the beginning. And the question is, uh, and they, it does not appear that they're coming at us quickly, but they are. Um, and so the challenge here is to figure out what are those, those uh, major changes, those bombs that are uh, coming along in, the near, in our near future. But the, point again is that when they do, they may not come, change may not come in a particular area soon, but when it comes, it will come much more quickly than we typically expect. So here, a last slide uh, on this topic, I've just shown what different industries were affected by the change in the underlying hardware, the, the technology. Of course, hardware was changed first. Software industry was changed. The priorities all change when memory gets much less expensive. I've described how the user interfaces changed um, in the 1980s. Consumer behavior around photos and audio and other information intensive um, uh, domains changed has been changing through the 90s. Now organizations and institutions have a lot more inertia. They tend to change more quick, more more slowly, but they are. Um, going to be affected, and in particular, uh, inf industries that are, have a very high information focus, uh, such, as, such as education, um, are particularly prone to be, changing, to be changed by these changes in information technology. Now I want to say just a little bit about the, um, give a little overview of human-computer interaction. When I started working in 1973, there were three main fields, apart from data entry, that computer involved computers. There were the operators who basically took care of the machine and loaded jobs. There was this low-paid job. The systems analysts were the people who were hired to decide what programs should be built. So that was a, the highest paid uh, profession. And then computer programmers, the job that I took, um, and 10 years later, each of these occupations had become a field of human, fact, of, of human computer interaction. So the computer systems technical group is the largest group in human factors. The information systems field had a human computer interaction focus. And within computer science, you had the computer human interaction uh, uh, SIG, one of the larger special interest groups, which focused on particularly on hands-on use of computers, first by programmers and then by others. So here I've shown these three fields again. At the top you've got the human factors. When, in 1958, when transistor-based computers came out, that was when it really became uh, uh, possible to imagine doing more with computers than when they were built with vacuum tubes. You had the first papers in human factors by Brian Shackle. Um, then in 1965, when integrated circuits, mainframes built up within integrated circuits, began to be uh, commercially marketed, the business, the business computing became a, a major focus. And you had this interest in human computer action, computer interaction in man schools of management and, uh, and uh, literature arriving from that. Then it was really in the early 80s when the PCs, the Macintosh came along that computer science really focused on, on this area. And the difference was 
that in the earlier era, the computers were so expensive that use was really not discretionary. People were hired to use the machine. They had to use the machine. Um, in the 1980s with PCs, there was much more of a focus on uh, discretionary use by consumers. First programmers who were discretionary users and then consumers. And again, a last a slide to just show how big an effect the, um, the changes in technology had. The, about every 10 years, a new generation of computers came along, and entire businesses formed around them, entire research fields formed around them. And people don't realize that. In fact, most younger people don't even know what a mini computer was. You know, they're not familiar with the, the mini computers, even though that industry was huge in the 1970s and 80s with Digital Equipment Corporation, Wang Laboratories, Data General, and others. Um, so just very dramatic changes here. Now, as you're aware, there is a fourth information uh, uh, intensive field that sort of belongs in this picture, and that is information library science and earlier you know, documentalism, bibliogra bibliography, and so forth. And why that is often left out, um, because the, in, in, in discussions of technology, or, or was for some time, because even though there was this very rich uh, history, a very relevant history. Um, in the beginning, unlike the other three branches of human-computer interaction, most of the technology focus in the information field was on technology used by specialists, by librarians and, and other specialists, and not so much on the end users. So this is Colin Burke, um, who wrote a history of information science, and he, he mentions that the, that the goal of creating tools useful to non-specialists was at best of secondary importance for a long time. At the same time, there really were very interesting uh, developments in the field. H.G. Wells, the science fiction writer, also wrote uh, nonfiction, and he was a big proponent of what he called the world brain. And I won't read through this, this excerpt, but he developed this, this picture of how you could use a new technology of the time, or two of them, index cards and photography to create what was effectively a human-powered or a desk clerk-powered web 2.0, which would just record information and distribute information on a massive basis. And when you read what he wrote, you can see that the system that he envisioned there with an army of attendants distributing this information would give rise to many of the, the issues that we deal with we think about now about privacy and, uh, and security and, and accuracy of information. Um, so of course this has changed now because information is, uh, the technology to handle information on a large scale is no longer just in the province of specialists. It's now it's, uh, it's something that we're all, that we all face, that students face and, and consumers face. And so in fact, information retrieval and related technologies are, have become part of the mainstream and are very relevant to the work going on in these other areas. Now, now let's start to turn to look at the future. And I've shown here a few different places where things are changing. So one is that in the technology sphere, engineers often don't get along very well with designers. They, they uh, who they don't see as, as working scientifically. And so for quite some time in the computer field, design was suppressed. But, but of course, as Steve Jobs has, has famously uh, revealed, design is very critical in technology. And so now we're sort of catching up. So design is moving up. And when we get a little more caught up, um, it may rise more slowly as, a, as, a, uh, as an influence. If there is somebody who the engineers get to trust even less than designers typically. It's marketing people, but marketing is also clearly critical to how we um, interact with technologies and what technologies we choose to interact with. So that's also going to be catching up and, uh, and growing in influence and human computer interaction. But both of these are not changing at a exponential rate. And so and information is. And information will continue, information that is of interest to people and of use to people 
is, is increasing um, at an incredibly rapid rate for virtually everybody, uh, and that's digitally represented information, and that will continue for some time. And so information is just going to be a critical focus uh, for the foreseeable future. And this, of course, this, this shift is, is, is evidenced by the introduction of the word, inf of the formation of information schools or the, or the shift from library schools to library and information schools that you're all very aware of. I've just shown when this happened for a number of, um, for a good number of universities over uh, the last few decades. And I want to, an aside, to just mention a recent book um, published by MIT Press that I think is a very impressive book that looks at how to build a bridge in terminology as well as in thinking about practices between library and information science on the one hand and computer science on the other by Bob Glushko, uh, who's at Berkeley. And full disclosure, I've written a foreword for this book, but I do not get any royalties or payments from it. I think it's a, it's a, if you're interested in this particular topic, I think it's a, it really is a good bridge. It's a sort of a solid bridge where before we've had a kind of a footpath between these, these different disciplines. Okay, so one of the consequences of this explosion in the um, amount of information that's, that's, that's relevant to, to each of us uh, is that just as we need personal trainers, or well, we don't need, but many people rely on personal trainers for health and fitness, it's clear that there's a role for personal trainers in information. And, and, to, and to a large degree, that is what reference librarians have often served as, is that people can come in with specific needs and, and find them focused. But the need for that um, help is delivered in one form or another by one, by, by one means or another is just going to be growing exponentially. It's just the amount of information that's out there available online that I really would be able to use and that would really be of interest to me now is huge information I'm not act finding and that is only going to increase. It's going to increase by orders of magnitude and so the usefulness of being able to help people find information that, that they find very valuable and useful is rising and so I think one of the questions, one of the challenges for us working in this general field is how do we go about um, being the people who will deliver this information to people in different contexts. But the need is, is certainly there, far more than, than personal trainers in the, in the fitness domain, I would argue. So this is from a recent New York Times um, debate or discussion on do we still need libraries? which you may have seen and in uh, last December. And below are some of the uh, are some of the possible roles for libraries that were discussed by people in this debate. And I think all of these have are have some um, have, you know have some possibilities, but I think they also point to the need to think about them in terms of the rate of change. So Bridging the digital divide or digital divides, uh, but those divides are going to change, are, are changing, and, and maybe many of them are disappearing as more and more people are connected, as people, smartphones are adopted, people do have access to the information. Computer skills for the elderly is currently a big, is a big, uh, um, is a big role for, the, and, and many of them find uh, help here in libraries, but again, the elderly are getting more sophisticated and the people who need that help are going to be going down in numbers over time, so you have to be thinking ahead. Hub for Citizen Science and Civics, the, the, the library, uh, public library in Seattle has, has uh, taken a very active role and done some experiments in how to give people information about upcoming elections. That's a possibility. The two the sort of contrary opposing um, opportunities for solitude and as a place for gathering are, are, also, uh, are also mentioned. And then finally, 
there was some discussion about how they, the libraries can be repositioned in formal education, which is moving into our topic. And here, so I want to talk. I want to mention one other um, a change in the the way that we interact with information. I think you'll be you will not be surprised to hear this, but as we get these new technologies and as we get a range of new skills and behaviors that people need to engage with them, uh, the, insofar as information goes, the need to very rapidly search or browse through available information and assess the quality of what we're seeing is becoming critical. This is just a critical skill for people in the younger generation because there is so much information and they're not going to they're, they're going to have to go directly to the sources in many cases and they're going to have to operate efficiently this is just an example this is from five years ago or or uh, or even a little longer six or seven years ago this is a high school handout that just is intended to train high school students to think about the information that they are that they are looking at the, to, to evaluate the provenance of the in, information the authors and so forth um, this was this this was unthinkable when I was in school all the information we got was in textbooks that came that they've been blessed by the publisher they've been blessed by the school board the the, the teachers um, it was all considered to be authoritative and we weren't at least where I grew up we were not challenged to, to question it it was a very radical notion to sort of question authority back then. It was five or six years ago in high schools they were teaching it. Now, even in elementary schools, my daughter in the fourth grade was going through a process like this of, of, of learning how to evaluate what she was encountering online on the web um, and to think carefully about what, uh, what might lie behind it. So this is, this is one of the skills that um, that is uh, that's increasingly critical. Walter Ong um, some time ago published a book in which he described the differences between oral and literate cultures and one can project that out and see differences also in digital cultures. And I'll just focus on the first row here where Ong noted that in oral cultures where you have to pass information down by word of mouth and you have to do it um, uh, uh, the, the, what you need are small, you need information in small bits that can be very quickly communicated and easily or easily remembered and, um, and, and, are repeat, and are often repeated so that people will pick them up. Whereas once we got, once we had books, once we had writing, uh, analysis rather than aggregation became more critical. You could actually sit down, you could write, you could write more expositorily, you could, you could read things more slowly and study them. And so the real focus became, a higher focus uh, was directed on analysis. And that's still been very much the mode in high, even higher education where a very typical course, you get a syllabus, you read something, you think about it, you discuss it, then you read something else and think about it and discuss it. So the analytic mode has prevailed for the last couple thousand years. Um, and but now we're getting to the point where the person who just reads one thing and thinks about it hard for a week or two is not going to fare very well. That what you really need to do is to go out and read multiple sources, you get multiple perspectives on a topic, and synthesize those. And so even though there was synthesis before, and there still is analysis now, there's a clear shift towards the, the advantage being in, in to very quickly, again, browse, um, uh, and and assess and then synthesize information from different sources and create something new in that way. Okay. So now where um, so where does uh, where do libraries fit in and how is educational mediation changing? Well, here I've I have a sort of a library centric overview that basically shows authors and publishers and instructors and students all interacted in different ways and depended and interacted with libraries in different ways. And the question that MOOCs raise is how might that be changing 
Um, is it going to be possible for authors to go directly to students and which of these other mediators will then be involved? And a point that's important to keep in mind here is that independent of MOOCs, massive open online education is clearly already here to stay. So we have YouTube with a phenomenal amount of educational material, Khan Academy videos, Wikipedia um, as of maybe as, a, as one source or a first source for information for a lot of people, I, Apple's iTunes, you know, you, you've got TED Talks with information that are, accum that are accumulating at a rapid rate, you've got various online archives where, where out of print books and other materials are preserved and can be accessed, used booksellers, um, Although I still go to, to libraries, it's certainly if I can find an old copy of a book for, for three or four dollars plus shipping uh, online, um, the, it's, that's far less expensive for me or for my employer than to have me spend an hour or two going off to the library. I'll still go off to the library to do, to do browsing and to do, search, to do more extensive searching, but used booksellers, I think, are a big piece of this picture. Textbook supplements, uh, a lot of the textbook publishers, in order to differentiate their materials, are creating online, uh, very, some of them very high quality online supplements that are available to the students and teachers. That's not open. And then MOOCs, of course, are another form of open online education. And that includes the present courses that are being taken by people, but it also includes Many of the MOOCs, they leave, the materials are left online afterwards, so you can go in and find lectures on topics uh, of interest, even without taking the entire course. So that's another, and that's another growing source of information, and it's one that's growing very rapidly right now. Okay, so I think education is an area where there are going to be just very major changes. Um, you can, you know, form your own view of this, but I think I'll say a little bit about K-12, that in pedagogy, and again, I think probably most of you are familiar with this, but in the United States, the 45 states have banded together in the Common Core State Standards, uh, which is a whole new focus on pedagogy, which is very information, more information intensive, not on memorizing facts, but on communicating and collaborating and doing and critical thinking and project-based learning. And all the assessment for these 45 states is starting in a year and a quarter is going to be online only. So again, that is driving schools to acquire the uh, technology that the kids will be using for assessments so that they can also use it in learning. And that is driving down the prices. So the prices are dropping dramatically and we're moving very quickly towards a situation where kids will have a device that they will carry around with them uh, through from class to class and at home and on field trips and so forth. And that really transforms what's possible pedagogically when, when a student is, has that device with them uh, all, the, uh, all the time. And a part of that is high resolution digital pens, which some of these devices have, um, which can be critical because education is, is one of few disciplines, maybe architecture, art, in which handwriting and sketching are part of the final product. So when kids take class notes, they don't retype them. And they sketch the parts of a cell or the layers of a leaf. You know, they don't get into a, 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 into a digital product to make a, a, a nicer looking um, illustration. Teachers, when they grade their circuit, they, they are marking by hand. It's more personal. It's much faster. And when they lecture, Unlike us, they can't count on the audience to, to follow, so they underline and circle and draw arrows. Um, all of it can be done digitally with a pen, and paper can really be eliminated when students have a device that they carry around and can take all their class notes on. Um, and so the point here, I think, is that people talk about digital natives, but really the first digital native generation truly digital native generation is just arriving. It's these kids, and there are some out there, in public, some in public schools, more in private schools now, who have these powerful devices that will soon cost very little uh, and that they can carry, that they carry around with them all the time. Okay, so on MOOCs, um, I, want to, I want to first discuss the potential for them and then, and then some of the issues. 
there's a paper, there's an article that I recommend that's in, I just saw in today's paper, it was published maybe late last night in the New York Times, and it's, and it's, it actually gets into the nuances. If you follow through to the end of the article, it really gets into what the setbacks are and how the MOOC developers are responding to them. So it's a very nice article and I, I recommend it. Um, so here are two questions about the potential. One is, can they work? Can distributed asynchronous video be effective? And we know the answer to that, and the answer is yes. Stanford did experiments in the 1970s, uh, which have been heavily replicated, um, that in, in which that were and the Stanford studies were published in this article in Science here, and in which they compared in a fairly controlled, not perfectly controlled situation, students who saw lectures live, who saw them, had them recorded or heard them remotely while they were going on live, and the and another condition was students who got them in video by as in VCR and videotapes and then watched them individually, and finally. The group of students who did best were the ones who got the videos and then met together in small groups to discuss the videos. And at the, in the Stanford studies, they had a TA, a teaching assistant, who led that discussion. And those were the students who performed best. And that was a very, that was more comparable to the MOOC uh, situation of they were remote, they didn't see the live lecture, um, but they did interact with each other um, and, and did very well. Now, and that was replicated, the, university, the second reference here, the University of Massachusetts replicated this, and they didn't even have teaching assistants involved. What they did was, when the students met, each time this one student would take responsibility for managing the session, for running the session, and again, they, out, they, they performed uh, uh, very well, they performed better than the students who took the live lectures. And it's been replicated uh, uh, elsewhere as well. However, so, so it's possible for this form of education to be very effective, but it didn't spread. So what does that tell us? Why didn't it take, catch on? Uh, will MOOCs do better than, than, than the uh, recorded videos did? And we don't have the answer to that. I mean, it's possible that just the overhead of coordinating all the, the recording and the distribution of the materials then was just too much to do on a wide basis. And it's possible that there's so just something special about live performances, even though you can learn without it. And so some students will under right conditions. It may be that often students just perform, uh, prefer the live, uh, live lectures. So we don't know that. I've had some thoughts on it. I have a couple of blogs related to, to, to MOOCs on my website. One's called Wrong About MOOCs, and one's called Couch Potato U. Um, I'm actually a little more positive than that sort of joking title indicates, but you can find those on my website if you want to see some of my thoughts on those issues. Looking at the, at what are the um, issues that the, the commonly encountered issues and impacts around MOOCs, um, and I want to sort of want, go through this fairly quickly because I'm near the end of my time, but attrition in courses is one uh, student assessment, how, we, how you assess performance and the credentials is another. The business models for MOOC providers uh, is one that's, that's discussed and, of course, is critical if, if, if they're going to continue in their current form. I think for assessment and credentials, I think we are moving into this era where you have to assess what you're reading, what you're seeing, what's in front of you uh, for yourself. And I think employers and others are going to be doing more of that which means that if somebody puts a MOOC, that they've taken a MOOC on their resume, then I think the employer will want to focus in on that and see whether they learned the material themselves to a larger degree than is true now. So I'm not sure that that's going to be a major issue. Um, what I do think you need to keep in mind in looking at the literature is that there are, it's not always recognized um, by the people writing about these, that there'll be differences in humanities classes, science classes, and technology classes, and, and then also vocationally oriented classes where people come in with different motivations and different goals in what they're learning. There's also, also differences between high school students, college students, and then people who are 
which is true of a lot of MOOCs who are taking uh, the, the courses after they've graduated. Another issue that's being experimented with or thought about is whether there's a role for local facilitators. So you've got the, the, the sort of the central MOOC with tens of thousands of students, but do you have local facilitators to meet with people in groups? And then what will the effects of this be on employment of, say, instructors? Um, and that's part of a larger picture where universities are under economic pressures and other changes as well. So I want to, my, my last um, point here in this talk is that, uh, that I'm, we don't have the answer to whether they're here to stay in their current form or flash in the pan, but what we do know is that wherever MOOCs are going, they are going to get there very quickly. And the reason why they're going to get there quickly is illustrated by this particular uh, MOOC, as, as well as others, it's, it's one given at the University of Michigan. At the, at the end of his lecture, Charles Severance um, has one, his last lecture was one describing the course and what he did and how he looked at the data as the course was progressing and what he was trying to do and how he changed in reaction to what he was seeing with this large amount of data. And it, and it shows what the potential is. It shows that if you have a few instructors who are very dedicated and talented and idealistic, they can have a huge effect. And the reason they can have such a large effect is because best practices can spread much faster than with, with previous uh, forms of education because you've got thousands of students experiencing them. Many of the people taking MOOCs now are instructors, so they can see what's working and what's not working. And also, the good examples will remain online and can be models looked at later. And all the data is being collected and it can be analyzed and used to improve the practices. And to get just to get at one of the issues, the issue of attrition, what Severance does in, in this lecture is he points out that even though 46,000 students signed up for his first, his first instance of this class, only 11,000 actually made it through the first week. But then over half of those completed the course. I think one of the problems that, that, the, that the classes have had is that they use these huge numbers and they overlook the fact that even in a real traditional class, you basically base the, re the enrollment on how many people are still there after the first week or after the first few lectures. And so once you look at it that way, the attrition is not as high as is reported. The numbers are lower, but still it's thousands of, of people. Um, there are some conferences I would direct your attention to. Uh, here are two conferences focused, research conferences focused on MOOCs. One is the first ACM conference called Learning at Scale, another is a European MOOC conference. And I'm on the program committee of this Learning at Scale. We've just, the program committee meeting is next week. We've, I've read, been reading the papers and reviewing the papers. And it's really refreshing to read these rigorous studies after years of reading popular press articles, interesting as, as some of them are. But there are rigorous studies going on. And what you see is that you can do very controlled studies of features and approaches. So you can take a MOOC with thousands of students and you can have half of them get one experience and half of them get another experience without even realizing that they've got these different arrangements and compare the outcomes. So again, the, the possibility for learning what works and what doesn't work is just phenomenal. And so I would encourage you next March uh, to, or, or before if the proceedings go online to look at this research. There's really some very nice research being done. But still, the authors tend to overgeneralize their results. They don't look at these issues such as whether the course is a humanities or a science or technology course or mostly taken by people with vocational interests, which, which will change their experience and, and how much you can generalize from what they have, uh, from what they report. But there's, um, it is going to be moving quickly and with that I will uh, see if there are any questions. Jonathan, thank you very much. There are, we'll wait for a few questions to come in. In the meantime, I, I have a couple of questions for you to, while we wait. Um, sure. and, one, and one is, I'm wondering um, from the standpoint of a librarian or from libraries, what is it that we can do to prepare ourselves for this exponential growth? Is there anything special that you could recommend? 
Well, I think that the that the that what I was suggesting was that in the same the people that I would go into the library with a particular particular need. So I mean, there are different. Of course, there are many different roles that libraries play. But I think that the key, uh, the sort of a key point is that the information needs of people and the benefits that they can get from being connected to the right information are going up, are just going up dramatically. And they already are up and they will continue to rise. And the librarians were, the, the libraries were a place where it connected me to information that I needed through my career. It would take me days to do that um, sometimes, but and that need is going up, and so I think that the, the the challenge is to think about how that need is going up and what the nature of it is, and figure out how you will be the personal information trainer. You will be in that role of connecting people to these resources. So that will mean knowing more about the, of course, knowing more about the digital resources. It will mean no knowing more about special collections or special resources that a particular library has that can be um, made more widely available and that you can connect people with. Uh, but I, I think it's the, the, the challenge there is that you're, I think that the people who have that background of knowing how information is organized, knowing how to find information is just a critical background, is just a critical uh, skill and it's figuring out how to how to develop it and how to apply it in a way that that will uh, that will serve the people who need it. So part of that, I guess, means like the as I mentioned, the public library in Seattle has an online interface, so that when there are elections, uh, people who are interested in different local propositions or or different races can come in and get. More objective information can get objective can get information that's been organized about these things in a very standard way, and they can do that online, so they don't have to go downtown uh, to do it. I think that's an example of where there is a clear information need that that that, um, that the library is 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 able to ha or has taken the initiative to to provide, and they've done it by going online in this case and. Um, by organizing that that information, so I think so it does feel as though the because of the, the the shift in the speed at which you can access these massive amounts of information online, it seems to me that a lot of what uh, libraries will be doing will be um, moving online. Does that? But I I, I assume that that's not uh, that that's not news. I mean, I assume that that's something that. Um, so, because I'm mostly a consumer of, of libraries, I'm a little reluctant to, and I, I don't know exactly where your thinking is on this. I've been thinking more about the education sphere. I'm a little reluctant to be too prescriptive, but I just see this huge potential for for um, connecting people up to information that's useful, uh, and that's what I always found libraries serving me in the past, and now I'm finding nobody serving me. I just have to go out and browse around or hear about things months after I wish I knew about them from friends. And I think if libraries can become part of that, it will be critical. I also think that there's clearly, for the people developing MOOCs and the publishers, you know, there's also still a big role in, um, in helping them get access to information mm -hmm. and, and make use of information. So that the other Sort of players in this in this picture are um, are also part of the, potentially part of the solution. Well, we have we have a few questions now, so let me um, start you off. Um, we have uh, somebody says you mentioned the change in technology um, as we move into the future, uh, from mini to micro to invisible and embedded, and wants to know if you can give more specifics about this vision of the future of technology. So I think the, so. The, so the question is, the technology is continuing to get smaller, and we're moving away from the microcomputer, which is sort of this uh, towards 
mobile devices and then towards even towards embedded computers that will be in our clothes and in our in, and in our um, utensils, you know, in, in our appliances and so forth. I think that a clear a place where they will come into the picture is that they will be a source of a lot of the information that the explosion of information that's available to us. So you will so people have access to information that is picked up geographically or around or you know or from people uh, through these sensors and effectors and so that will be part of the massive amount of information that's coming in. So I think when you're thinking about the information space and what information it is that people will be looking to get access to, um, those technologies are going to be a major part of it. So what happened historically, what happened in the 80s was that you had these huge mainframe computers and suddenly the market kind of saturated. Companies, large companies all had one mainframe. They didn't need any more. There were all these little PCs together, PCs out there. They were hard to network at first and they weren't very powerful. And the computer industry ignored them to a large degree. IBM gave away their mainframe business, uh, their PC business. And they were trying to find ways to make supercomputers to make mainframes more powerful. And what happened was, while they were focused there, these PCs got networked together and the internet arose without much planning and the web arose and became a major force that was unanticipated. And I think what we're seeing now is a similar thing where, every, where most people have a PC and maybe they have a phone, but they don't need more of those, but they're getting lots of other little devices and we're starting, we're starting to have sensors that you can put into your clothes and sensors that are monitoring your health, your, your, your biological uh, uh, profile. And those are sort of weak little devices and they're hard to network, but people are working very hard at networking them and filtering that information and aggregating that information and making it available. And so the same thing, is, there'll be an explosion of information that we'll have. We already have it in the form of sort of primitive form of traffic sensors for large cities where you can see the traffic flow, but that will be magnified to a high degree. In, around here they're putting sensors now in all the roads. And so I think that the, the point there is that when you think about what information is being collected by these technologies and is being relayed digitally, you can start to see what areas will be of greater focus and of greater interest or need to people out there. So clearly, I mean, health is maybe not a surprise, but health, people will be getting far more information off than they, than they do now about the state of their health and about uh, this, the state of what's available to, to address health issues. Um, and so, so I guess that, that's, so that's my, that, that would be my response there. Um, I'm not sure that those technologies, and then occurred to me to think about whether those technologies will actually play a role in the classroom or in beyond, you know, smaller than phones. Phones will clearly be part of it, but whether embedded technologies will will have a role in classrooms is a good is a good question for you to think about. Um, that's exactly the kind of unexpected uh, development that that could come along. Uh, Rob, Jonathan, here's another question. Should the tools for assessment of MOOCs be the same as for face-to-face -face education? And second part of the question, do you trust any of the tools used in the United States for educational assessment? So I think that the, so I think, I guess I would say, I don't think the tools for MOOCs for assessment are should be the same or will be the same as for educational assessment in, in many uh, much of the time, um, I think that you've got, in the case of MOOCs, you've got two differences. Are One is you actually have the capability to have much finer grained and different forms of assessment uh, that can be, uh, that can be very useful, which I mentioned before. Another is that, at least currently, the people who take MOOCs have a very wide variety of different motives for taking them. Uh, so, for example, and so I've had some experience with, uh, before I was at Microsoft, I was 
professor at, uh, at the University of California at Irvine. And when I came here, I worked for a time with, with internal training of professionals, uh, training courses, and it's just very different. People come in with very different motives and, and, and backgrounds. So in the university, you generally can assume that the students come in and they have fairly similar backgrounds, educational backgrounds, fairly similar motives as to what they're, why they're in, in, in the university and you can give them the same sort of assessment. When you get people in, in training courses in, in, the, in an in industry, people come in, some people come in because they want to learn it from the beginning, from the ground up, like they do at universities. Some people come in because it's just one area that they need to, to learn about and they know most of it. Some of them just want a refresher. Some of them are just there for a day away from the, from the office. So you have very different motives coming in and, they're, and therefore how you would assess uh, how you would assess the effectiveness of the class is going to be more variable. And so I think that's, that is also the case with MOOCs. The other, the other, another way in which I think assessment is not going to be as, potentially it's not going to be as important, which I alluded to, is this was brought home to me when a friend forwarded me a resume that he'd gotten in the mail a few years ago, a couple years ago, and said, look at this. And so I looked at it. It was from a student in at one of the IIT universities in India. And it was a nice resume. It was a design student. It was nicely organized. And just a little section down at the bottom said, MOOCs taken. And it just listed two. One of them was Scott Clemmer's HCI MOOC. Um, and there was another on a programming language, I think. And when I looked at it, two things struck me. One was that, well, this student has really shown some initiative in going out and taking a couple courses in areas that he didn't you know, they didn't get uh, at his university. The other thing that struck me was, if he didn't really learn that material, it was a big mis He shouldn't have put it in at all. Because if I was thinking of hiring him as my as a person who forwarded to me, who was actually in, in Europe, um, if, if I was thinking of hiring him, the first things I would do are I'd say, well, he took this MOOC. Uh, I want to call him up and actually talk to him a little bit about HCI to see if I think he learned the material. Uh -huh. And I could also contact my friend Scott Clemmer, who taught the course, and say, I don't know what personal information, what, what sorts of restrictions there are, but I could potentially say, how did he do? Um, and so all that information is there. So he really should know his, his, his stuff. Uh, if at, at a point when people have taken 30 or 40, you're, you probably can't go in and ask them questions about all of them, but you can ask them questions about the ones that are significant to you. And I think that's part of this whole shift towards not relying on authorities, not relying on credentials, but you actually have to go out and verify what you see on the web. So I think that so I think assessment is a big issue and there's people who are hoping that AI assessment will, will come in and I don't think that that's going to happen, uh, at least in, on a major scale. So that's um, so that's part one. Part two is what do I think about the tools used in education, educational assessment in general. And there, I'm more optimistic. Now, it still remains to be seen, but I mentioned this Common Core state standards. And in, in this country, where there's a big shift away from just testing, multiple choice testing of isolated facts towards assessment that's based on communication skills, collaboration skills, critical thinking skills. Um, and it remains to be seen, but they've been working for some years on that. And what I've seen of the educational, the pedagogical change in my daughter's schools, which have shifted over to this new way, uh, this new approach, I'm very impressed. I think there's a lot of potential there. The assessment is still being worked out. They piloted it for the first time this year. They'll pilot it a little bit more in, uh, in, in 2014 at the end of the year. And then it goes into effect in 2015. So. We'll see, but, but I'm basically optimistic. I don't think that they've necessarily marketed it as effectively as they might. They sort of wrote, rushed it out in New York last year. Um, and there will be an adjustment to it, but I guess I, I'm inclined to think that we're heading towards the golden age in K-12 education because of the pedagogical change, first and foremost, and secondly, because of the technology and what it will make possible. 
Um, Jonathan, one, one other s small question. I'm not sure whether you are in a position to answer this or not, but could you say a few words about the survey, the collaborative work that you're doing on MOOCs, and when there might be some tangible product from that? So I think that what I would encourage, I'll, so I'll repeat this, what I would encourage um, people to do is to look at this, I mentioned this conference, the learning at ACM's Learning at Scale conference. Mm -hmm. um, and so there you're going to see a whole set of research papers. And they really are starting to, they both get in, in some specific areas, they really get at what's going on in a way that, that you just don't see so much in the anecdotal mass media reports. And also, the methods show you what's possible, and they show you where, what kinds of studies people are doing, and so then you can, you can kind of gauge where that's likely to be heading. Um, so I would recommend that. The, and I don't know quite when that will be available. The conference itself is in March but you can contact me. It's the decisions about the papers will be made next week. And at that point, at some point after that, they'll be made available online. Or the list of authors and papers will be made available online much sooner. And you could then contact the specific authors um, if you were interested. So, so I would say that the research, I'm just, I've become more optimistic since that, that that there's going to be some very high quality information to help guide your thinking about where MOOCs are going. Uh, okay. So. Um, I think we've come to the end of our hour, so we probably should um, wrap this up. And um, I want to thank you for the comments that you made and your insights on uh, the, the future of online learning, MOOCs, and human-computer interactions, and the suggestion that we uh, keep our eye on one or both of those conferences that you um, mentioned, and uh, we'll we'll go forward from there. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, just, let me. I'll just wrap this up very quickly um, and and remind everyone that there will be a brief survey about today's session. Um, that, will you, that you will receive very soon. Uh, we hope you'll take just a moment to respond. Your feedback um, about not only today's session as well as comments on the ELECT's continuing education program helps us in planning future CE events on topics and issues of interest to you. A number of continuing education events have already been scheduled for the spring of 2014, including several new webinars on MOOCs. Please check the ELECT's website for complete details about the full range of CE offerings as the site is updated regularly to reflect new content. Now, as we conclude today's session, I'd like to draw your attention to an exciting event scheduled for midwinter if you're planning to go to Philadelphia. The ELECT's midwinter symposium, Here There Be Dragons, public access to federally funded research will be held on Friday, January the 24th. This is a wonderful opportunity to hear outstanding speakers consider how libraries will deal with the complex issues outlined in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Memorandum issued last February directing federal agencies to develop a plan to support increased public access to the results of research funded by the federal government. And now as we bring today's session to a close, my thanks again to Jonathan for the stimulating and thought-provoking presentation. And thank you to Eva Sorrell for providing technical support. We look forward to welcoming you at ELECT's continuing education events in the future.